What is an institution according to Eleanor Ostrom? And I'm doing a series on this book, Governing the Commons. The subtitle is The Evolution of Institutions for Collective Action. So this is actually a very specific type of institution. And most of her examples of successful institutions from the past that she's looking at in this book are these historical small towns who are governing some kind of common pool resource, which might be a fishery or a lake, or it might be a river that irrigates their plants or a forest that sustains the population. So all of the examples in this book are really collective action examples where the town has to work together to make sure that they're not degrading this shared resource. Now, there's a broader understanding of institutions that I will oftentimes use, so let me set that up before I go into her definition. And the broader definition I would use would be an institution is a set of roles, rules and regulations, expectations, relationships between people in different roles, and enforcement mechanisms that sort of structure human relationships in some kind of setting. So with the broader definition, it includes things like markets, where there is a buyer and a seller, and expectations about how that exchange happens. It includes things like marriage, where both partners have a series of obligations that they're expected to fulfill to one another. It includes the family, where parental expectations toward their children are part of sort of how we structure society. But the kinds of institutions that are closer to what she talks about in this book are going to be the firm and a governing regulatory body. So like in the firm, you have managers and you have workers and there's roles and rules for structuring their relationships. And pretty much the same within a regulatory body, um, a government institution that, that regulates private firms. They have their own structure that's a little bit more official within the institution. And that's going to map onto what she's doing here. Now, of course, what she's doing here is trying to create institutions where the community comes together and collectively governs their institutions instead of having government come in from the outside and instead of having a private firm come in and govern the institution, as oftentimes happens. So that's her setup. Now, let me read you her definition and we'll go through this piece by piece. Institutions can be defined as the set of working rules that are used to determine who is eligible to make decisions in some arena, what actions are allowed or constrained, what aggregation rules will be used, what procedures must be followed, what information must or must not be provided, and what payoffs will be assigned to individuals depending on their actions. There's a lot packed in that definition, so let me just pull out some of the more important parts. Her definition is all about working rules. So what are rules? And she actually defines rules as any um, statement that forbids, permits, or requires something of somebody. Now, how do working rules differ from rules overall as sort of an umbrella category? If they are working rules, they're rules that are actually used and practiced, they're monitored, and they're enforced. So we all know situations where there's some rule on the book that is ridiculous and is no longer enforced or used, and that would not be a working rule. And we all know some rules where there's sort of an implicit agreement among people to follow that rule, but it's not written down anywhere. So that would also be a working rule. It doesn't have to be official to be part of the rules within an institution. And I think that's an important point because she's looking at these historical small towns where everybody has relationships with each other, their families have relationships that go back centuries in, in many cases, and if you think about what governs the community, there are going to be some social rules built in in addition to the rules that the council comes up with in their annual meeting where they're deciding, you know, how much water does each farmer get to pull from the river. 
She also mentions the working rules need to be common knowledge among the community. So that means, and she defines all three of these parts, that everybody knows the rules, everybody knows everybody else knows the rules, and everybody knows that everybody else knows that they know the rules. There's this sort of back and forth because no one will follow the rules unless they are common knowledge, unless everybody is sort of collectively enforcing these rules. And that's one of the key things she's looking for is the community itself enforcing the rules instead of some external authority. Now, I do think it's helpful to have a common example from her book in our heads as we're thinking this through. So a lot of the examples she goes through have to do with shared uh, ownership over a river where the river irrigates the crops, but the river is kind of perhaps a little bit fickle. Some seasons it over rains, some, many seasons it goes dry too early in the season so that people's crops cannot finish um, producing their fruit. And therefore, to make sure that people don't overdraw too much water from the river, they have sort of a system set up such that everybody has a little time slot where they draw water. But oftentimes the time slots may not be exactly equal because it depends on rainfall, it depends on local conditions. There also may be unequal sort of access to the irrigation system where maybe the irrigation system is farther from the river for one particular person. So there's all of these local complexities that um, the citizens need to think about. And when we're thinking about working rules in that circumstance, the rules are you can only draw water from the river during your specific time slot. And that might be a couple of days, or that might be uh, one day every other week, something like that. And if you draw water from the resource any other time, you are violating the rules, you're subject to sanction by the community. And one thing that's helpful when it comes to both monitoring and also enforcing these rules is that there's this repetitive thing, like this season happens every year, um, people monitor each other and so we see when someone violates the rule, um, and because we see things enforced, we know from our neighbors, from their gossip, who got caught drawing water when they shouldn't have. That repetitive nature um, makes sure that everyone knows that everyone's monitoring the resource and helps with the enforcement because everyone also knows that uh, whoever violates has the same uh, penalty regardless of their status in, in the community. There's a very democratic nature to what she's doing in studying these, these communities. Now, she notices three types of rules that are nested under one another. So I would like to go through each of those three rules. The three layers of rules are constitutional choice rules, which basically structure these annual meetings that these communities of people have. These determine who can vote, how often they can change the rules, what are the procedures to change the rules. Collective choice rules, these rules happen basically at these local town hall meetings. These are the democratic rules that people who show up to the meetings vote on and vote into practice. And that might be rules like what are the penalties for drawing water out of turn? What determines who gets which time slot if you're drawing water in certain time slots? Things like that. It's these rules everyone agrees to. And then operational rules are rules that help the people people who are enforcing and who are managing on the day-to-day -day level th that helped them do their job. So operational rules might be something like if you're the person enforcing the rules and you're required by the collective choice rules to check once a day to make sure nobody's drawn water, then the operational rules might say this is what you do in the moment when you're trying to to check that. And one thing about this nested structure of the rules is that it's more difficult to change rules at the top level than it is at the bottom level. Like the bottom level rules could be rules that um, 
have enough vagueness such that someone who's enforcing them might have to make some judgment calls. Maybe there's going to be conflict that arises over these judgment calls. Like, um, did the person stop by the end of the day? Well, does the day end at midnight? Does the day end when the sun goes down? How do you define the day? And so if the community decides actually someone's making a judgment call on that and we don't like the judgment call, it's fairly easy to redefine that rule and to say, okay, actually, um, the day ends at midnight exactly. And therefore, these rules are fairly easy to change. The collective choice rules are meant to reflect the collective desires of the population. So you don't want those to be too easily changeable when there's disputes among people because you're not going to have the, the full community uh, collected together to make the rules except for at their annual meeting. And of course, constitutional rules are, are the highest level whatsoever. And so these are hard to change because if you change these too often, then the institution becomes unstable. And I will say it's not always 100% clear which level a particular rule belongs in. But let me give you the words she associates with each of these levels, just so you can get a sense for what she's talking about. Constitutional choice rules involve formulation, governance, adjudication, and modification of the rules. And you may notice that the middle layer, the collective choice rules, also has adjudication listed. This is on page 53 if you have this edition of the book. Um, the middle layer also has policy making and management, whereas the operational rules, the lowest layer has provision, monitoring, enforcement, and approbation. Now, I will say a lot of the words used in this book are kind of jargony and were pretty difficult for me to figure out when I was uh, reading through the book. She constantly uses the word appropriator and appropriation. And I think what she means by that is members of the community who are at once people who are uh, taking some of the resource, giving the resource, but also participating in this governance process. So that was, uh, that was just frustrating, the level of jargony this is. But she's just trying to come up with how are institutions structured. And I think this layered sort of nested set of rules is really helpful for thinking about properties of institutions because not all rules are as easy to change as other rules and thinking about what layers of rules are easier to change, what are harder to change, why it's difficult to change institutions because um, you have to sort of start with the bottom layer, but sort of work your way up, and any rule you change at the top is going to have ripple-down effects to rules at the bottom layers. There's going to be conflict between the different rules that are set up going from top to bottom. So this nested structure sort of sets up the notion that institutions are complicated, and if we're modeling them, we need to keep the interdependency of these different layers of rules in mind.